Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and tonight we're going to take a look at the drop number 12 for Spyderco. Very exciting. A uh, Cold Steel Voyager sub-collection in the XL range. Complete? Question mark. And then we take a look at my top drawer large fixed blade knives. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. Uh, my favorite comment from this past week was from Marlin1895. He said uh, he was talking about one of the videos I put up, one of the shorts where I had a bunch of five of my most menacing Bowie knives, I believe it was. And he said, they're kind of ridiculous looking, comical even, more than more like machetes than knives. And then he says, me, I'd rather have an Arkansas toothpick, smiley face. And I, I love this because at first I started reading it and there are a lot of comments that are like this where they're kind of like, oh, that's a ridiculous knife. You know, what do you need a knife like that for? And I thought that's where he was going with this. But that was a red herring. He he kept it to saying, I want my own ridiculous kind of knife. I want my own like double-edged short sword, uh, you know, from the early, early pioneer days. So I appreciate that kind of sense of humor, uh, knife senses of humor. It's almost like dad knife sense of humor there. Uh, I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate all the comments uh, I see each week. I really appreciate it. And, and I just want to say, um, actually, right up front here, uh, we've had a, a lot of new subscribers here. And I just want to say, we have interviewed and covered a lot of people over the last four years. Uh, so if you hear me referencing episode numbers here, that's just so you can, this is like cross-referencing. It's like an audio link. So you can go check out uh, different makers uh, that that might play into to, uh, today's, to this episode, uh, whether you're listening to it in the day or the night. So I think on top of all of that, it is time now for a pocket check. All right. So today was a road trip day. Uh, I came in hot today uh, from a week, uh, from a little bit of time away with my family. It was great. We had a lot of fun. We went to our little mountain redoubt. Um, so that means in my front right pocket was the Microtech SOCOM Elite. At this point, it's become a superstition. I have to go on road trips with this uh, in my pocket. This was my very first uh folding knife with a S35VN. So this is pretty old. And also my first folding knife with a um, window breaker, you know, glass breaker on the pommel. So this became my road trip knife a long time ago, figuring, you know, if the, if the, if I need to break out of the car for whatever reason, heaven forbid, uh, I'll have a glass breaker with me. Uh, since then, I've acquired many glass breakers. They're all over the car. As a matter of fact, uh, if I, if I stop short, uh, I'm in danger of breaking the window. So I got to be careful. Uh, but uh, this was in my pocket today. I love this thing. This has done everything uh, from open cans, uh, you know, just like making a triangular uh, opening in cans. This has also uh, cut waffles, kind of an awkward affair, cutting waffles. Uh, but I, I, I learned how to use this front portion, you know, to, to go along the plate and then use the angle of the rest of the blade to, you know, slay the waffle. But so this is, this has done everything on these road trips. And so this was in my pocket today. Always at, uh, always proud to have that. Uh, that carries really nicely. And it's one of two knives, one of two knives that I excuse the tip down only configuration. Uh, we're going to talk about that other knife a little bit later on. And uh, that's the, uh, military from spider co some exciting things happening with that knife. Okay, a little fore foreshadowing there. Uh, next up on me, this did uh, this did a lot of duty this weekend. Uh, was the Jack Wolf Knives Low Drag Jack, uh, the latest from Jack Wolf Knives. This thing is a beautiful bullet ended Jack. Mine is in black canvas micarta that is starting to patina nicely. Um, Man, the quality of the micarta on these Jack Wolf knives uh, is really awesome. One thing uh, I've been getting into oiling them to to bring out that rich, beautiful co color, and then I'll slip them into the 
leather cases they come with, which are line, you know, leather on one side, suede on the other, naturally. And the suede soaks up the oil. So I'm trying to see how long, how many times uh, that'll happen before the oil, before the um, micarta remains kind of dark from the oil. Anyway, a beautiful, beautiful knife. This was a breakfast knife for me, um, breakfast and pizza knife. You say pizza knife? What kind of? Well, we we made some Detroit style pizza, and it got very uh, crusty on the bottom. So I used this to breach said crust for my breakfast with eggs. Uh, you know, pretty pedestrian uses for my pocket knives, and uh, I am way overdoing it with how I carry, um, with how I collect, with how I live. You know, I could uh, I could get away with a 420 HC buck for the rest of my life, no doubt, uh, even, you know, the cheapest among them, and I would be fine, but I choose not to. All right, next up, uh, on my hip uh, all weekend was the um, Hogtooth Knives Ruffian, no surprise, uh, just about my favorite fixed blade knife these days, and I say that because I carry it all the time. Um, maybe some of these others, uh, which are all amazing, uh, would be the would take that uh, title if I carried them every day, you know, uh, but this beautiful 154 CM hollow ground, um, what is it? Four and a half inches. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. About five inches soup to nuts on the blade. Uh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Forgive me. One, two, three, four and a half inches. Don't judge. Uh, four and a half inches here of hollow ground 154 CM with that really nice long, dare I say harpoon swedge. Uh, it's not a harpoon swedge because I don't like harpoon swedges. So this is something much like a harpoon swedge. Really excellent uh, jimping right there. Zero ground on the on the swedge, though in the tumbling process, it got a little bit uh, rolled over there. So um, just beautiful. Just beautiful. Uh, I asked for a zero ground swedge. So uh, just in case, you know, I need to do a back cut. I can inflict some damage. Um, of course, that's just me being goofy. A beautiful uh, handle. This is um, a really, really comfortable handle. This size and then in that smaller EDC Tonto I carry, uh, by the way. Uh, we've come up with a name for the uh, our collaboration knife, the Lil Jim. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you with that. But that's what we're calling it amongst the two of us. And that's going to be here sometime this week. Very excited. And I'll, of course, be showing that off and blabbing a whole ton about that but uh hog tooth knives uh, i love them uh you'll see number one on my list of top drawer knives is a hog tooth custom but these uh these ones that he does that are water jetted out and then he does everything else by hand are um i don't know what you call them like his semi-production knives they're so awesome man they're really really good and then uh for emotional support my esk basically uh for the past four days has been my Benchmade bug out. Just an awesome knife, man. I, I I forget how much I love this knife because this does duty in my um, Duluth Trading Company winter coat inside pocket. Uh, and that's what the, I have that Snaggletooth MF on there. So I if I need it, I can just pull it out of my inside pocket and deploy it or or pull it out just regular regularly. Uh, these are Allen Putnam um, Micarta Scales canvas micarta scales with that uh anzo pattern um really great i got these before the before bench made themselves and and a whole cottage industry sprung up around handles for this these were the first ones i saw because i could not stand the blue uh but really recognized how awesome the blade and everything else is about the bug out so i love that knife so that's what i had on me today uh for this uh, travel day it was the SOCOM Elite by Microtech. That's a 2013 model, by the way. My favorite configuration of a Tonto <clears throat> from them ever. Uh, and then uh, I had the Jack Wolf Knives Low Drag Jack, the Hog Tooth Ruffian, and the Benchmade Bug Out. Uh, let me know what you were carrying on you today. As I always like to say, it's inspiration, even if I don't end up buying the knife. You know, there are a lot of knives to buy, and I like hearing what my very, very classy viewers and listeners uh, like to carry. Oh, by the way, walk and talk on this. Outstanding. Uh, I did not open this uh, for you and close it too much, but yeah, you know, the usual. And one thing I forgot to mention about this about this Jack Wolf Knives low drag jack is the different steel. It's S90V steel on it. I think there were requests for something other than M390 and uh, came up with S90V. So I'm very excited. My first S90V knife. <clears throat> 
Okay, coming up on uh, the 19th of January is the Gentleman Jack, <laughs> Gentleman Jack, sorry, the Gentleman Junkie Knife Giveaway. And um, I'm very excited uh, to be giving away this knife here. Now I have one and I have a couple of mini versions of it or baby versions of it. And when I got this, uh, I really had to hold myself back from keeping it for myself. Uh, so uh, this came in from Carrie Orifice uh, of Off Grid Knives. He sent me four knives. Check out our affiliate link with Carrie uh, with Off Grid. And um, so he sent me these and it was this and two of the Tracker uh, X2s, this awesome outdoor knife. And uh, and a baby rhino in this coloration. Uh, rhino is one of my favorite of the large knives by Off Grid. This is the one that my brother got on my recommendation um, to my dad, and then I felt all jealous. I wanted it was more like envy. I wanted it really badly, and I thought my brother was just kind of uh, over flipping it that one Christmas. I was like, okay. Uh, but anyway, to, to see it in this coloration, my very favorite, that gray wash blade and the coyote tan handle is, uh, mm, it is awesome. So uh, Gentleman Junkie is the, our high tier of support at Patreon. That's a, the $10 per month uh, level of support. And there are other levels or you get other cool stuff, go check it out. But I just wanted to show off the knife uh, for those of you in the running. And for those of you considering uh, becoming a a, uh, a gentleman junkie. Uh, we do the usual Thursday night knives, uh, spin the wheel of destiny, and whoever gets it, gets it. I mail it off a couple of days later, or in some cases, more than a couple of days later, but you get your knife, and you get some stickers, and you get a handwritten note, and all of that. So very much looking forward to the Gentleman Junkie Knife Giveaway. If you do want to become a uh, part of that, uh, just scan the QR code on your screen or go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So this is the Spider Code drop I've been waiting for for a year. Because within this Spider Code drop comes the update of the military. My lands, what have they been waiting for? I mean, this knife has been around forever. This has been around since before the paramilitary. Uh, and certainly since before the para three. Uh, maybe it's because it's not as popular because it's a full four inch blade and it's a largish knife, but it's always been thin. It's always been light. It's always been awesome. Uh, and the only reason this has not spent more time in my pocket is the orientation. It is tip down only. Um, and that is because they wanted to keep this big knife as light as possible. No liners on these G10 handles, uh, just a little bit uh, around uh, the inset liner lock and uh, around the pivot but and and that's what anchors this tip down clip but i've always said and i'm not the only one there a chorus of people have said why not just put tiny little plates of metal on the other end they're not going to weigh that much we'll take the weight so that we can mount it uh tip up the proper orientation and um they finally listened and that's part of this uh drop this drop 12 and i don't mean to sound like an ingrate and i'm not a huge spider co fanboy so it's not like i've been waiting around uh like i might be for a re-release of the black rhino from cold steel which will never happen uh but this one really does excite me the interesting thing okay so let's let's bring this up shall we jim uh it's now that we've taken a look at my my spider co uh so if we scroll down one one blade from that feature blade there We'll see the military. Now, what they've done with it, well, they, they have it pictured uh, tauntingly with the clip in the uh, tip-down orientation, which is how they ship their knives anyway. But I, I just think it's funny. It's like, 
uh, they finally, finally have given the people what they want, but they won't, they won't ship it that way. Uh, but anyway, um, you've got this beautiful, beautiful military shape. I love it. I think this is the best expression visually, of course, visually of the para series. I think the para three, which is a great knife I've heard is a little stubby looking. I've always thought the para two had a blade to handle, uh, ratio issue visually, uh, but is a great user. And uh, I always thought the military was just the sweet spot. Oftentimes, the bigger cars, the larger versions of things just express the lines better. And I always thought that about this. But also in terms of use, um, kind of the same blade as the Para 2, Paramilitary 2, just a little bit longer. But you got that same uh, full flat ground, awesome geometry. And you have the strength, you know, in a, in a thin, light package. The other very, very exciting thing... Um, is well they've expanded the lanyard hole just kidding that's not the other very exciting thing the other very exciting thing is that it's got a uh, compression lock so like the para 3 and the para 2 you can now fidget with your military uh and i i'm really excited about this i really this is this is a spider co that i'm going to go out and get it's uh it's going to come in about 200 bucks I, I believe 196 dollars i think msrp uh, and of course, there will be a scad of, um, oh, you know, sprint versions and stuff like that as as time goes by. Uh, but this one, oddly enough, they're releasing it after all of this, after all of this reworking in S30V, which is a great steal. And it's what the, you know, para paramilitary two and the military have always kind of uh, come in base model. But I just think it's kind of funny. I think it's kind of funny. It's sort of funny, kind of like uh, the shipping it with the clip tip down, even though they've given us the tip up option now. Of course, left and right hand and uh, everything else you want that you get out of a fully loaded Spyderco. But I'm really excited about this. Um, so anyway, let's take a look at what else they have real quick uh, coming out. Um, these are kind of neat. These little three inch uh, fixed blades, uh, kind of an overall uh, large package for a small and very thin three inch um, fixed blade knife, uh, but that's not unusual for fixed blade knives from Spyderco. They're, they're the, 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 what do you want to call it? The footprint of their sheaths are usually uh, a little much if you ask me. Uh, but this one comes in a clip point as pictured there. And then there's a drop point that we saw earlier. That looks a bit like a sheep's foot. They're coming out with the paramilitary two in a 15 V sprint model. And let's look at that. Uh, uh really, uh, let's see that handle. I'm trying to, so they always have a different handle color when they release a different sprint run and a different steel. And this one is kind of walking the line between brown and mauve. I don't know. But the mauve sprint run, that doesn't that doesn't sound so good. But it looks beautiful, of course. And you know that 15V is going to be uh, incredible. Um, so look for that. Uh, let's see. There are some people out there who have, you know, all of them, all the steels, the counter critter. This looks like a great little four inch, you know, leave on the counter and cut whatever you need to cut kind of thing, uh, including packages and string. Uh, and then at the very bottom, they're going to have a new run of K390 uh, variants. So, uh, the enough Two, the little temperance three. That's the one pictured. It's a cute little knife. Uh, and I think that's cool. K390 seems to be a really uh, interesting steel in that you can. Uh, I like that you can get it to patina. <laughs> I don't know what uh, what else its its qualities are, but I know people really, really love it. Like uh, Cedric and Ada, he loves that steel. Anyway, uh, that's what's coming from Spider Code Drop Number Twelve. I'm very excited, but as you can tell, most excited about the military too. The exotic steels, I, I love that they do it because I also know that Spider Co is renowned for their heat treat. Um, so whatever exotic steel they feature, it's not like they're going to bungle it. And I think that that's great. It's just that I don't really have the knowledge or the raw enthusiasm for the steels as much as I do for the designs and that kind of thing. So uh, anyway, look for all of that to come, especially uh, the new military right here. All right. And now from Monterey Bay Knives, very exciting. Uh, they're releasing the Min Pin again in a 2.0. Now the Min Pin was the knife that launched Monterey Bay Knives. Uh, check out uh, my interview with Owen Sanford of Monterey Bay Knives. That was uh, episode 136. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash 136 and listen to our conversation about how Monterey Bay Knives came to be. Uh, pretty interesting. And he's a cool dude. 
but I'm I'm really excited to see this Minpin re-release. Um, Minpin stands for Miniature Pincher. Uh, it's a design by Ray Laconico, a renowned dog lover or a known dog lover. Uh, but in this version, they're trading in um, S35VN on that beautiful clip point blade for ZDP 189, uh, a clad uh, Japanese steel. And and the handle is now a smooth titanium instead of with the lightning holes. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful knife. Um, and that, this is the one that they started the whole thing with. So it's exciting to see. Um, coming out from them uh by the way ray laconico just keep your i mean keep your eye on him not like he's an up-and-comer he's a he's a dominator of the industry look at that that even looks beautiful closed on the clip side um but ju just i mean this man is really prolific so keep your eyes peeled for his designs across a number of brands beautiful stuff all right still to come on the knife junkie podcast we're going to take a look at my cold steel xl voyager uh, collection i'm now beaming with pride as it as it is complete ex except for one that's going to nag at me uh and then we're going to take a look at my top drawer large fixed blade knives the Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. One thing I forgot to mention about the min pin, I'd be, uh, I, this would be a problem if I didn't mention it, um, is, and this is my favorite part about it, is that they made it like other Monterey Bay knives. I'm going to put this under the uh, knife cam real quick, in that it is an inset liner lock in titanium. It is not a frame lock. Um, and that I realized, uh, right when Jim, uh, cut, I realized that's what makes it so beautiful to me. You flip it over and on the lock side, uh, there, there wasn't the lock. It was just a beautiful, smooth titanium. So that is a, a, one thing I wanted to mention. I know a lot of people have been very happy and excited about titanium lin liner locks recently. And I wanted to mention that that min pin is one. Okay. Uh, now moving along to my cold steel XL Voyager sub collection. Um, this is something that I started a while ago. And then, in other words, I had uh, I had both when it was just the clip point and the Tonto. I'm going to put the clip point under here as this is my newest one in OS 10. Uh, I had the clip point and the Tonto years back in OS 8A. And then I got to know Jimmy Slash and uh, really, really had to uh, get myself an XL Recon 1. So I, I got an XL Recon 1 clip point and Tonto just right before they kind of stopped making them. And I was like, oh, since I have my XLs, I can get rid of the Voyagers. Well, I almost immediately regretted that after very generously giving them to two friends. Um, and so all I had left was the Vaquero, which I, I forgot to mention before. Um, and then ever since then, it's been a, a now I need to reconnect with the Voyager and I've got them all back and I'm not going to get rid of them. Like this is what I've decided of of all of the knives uh, besides my some of my very top folders, uh, the, the ones that I don't want to get rid of until the very end are my cold steels, my cold steels, my Emerson's and then a couple of top top shelf folders. And then uh, and that's all I'm talking about on the folder end of things. But these large cold steels. I just never, I'm going to part with them because no one else is doing it. Some people do on occasion, they'll put out one or two models, but they're the ones who do it and they do it best. Uh, so I have here the clip point. Um, really awesome. I love OS 10 a, uh, by the way, uh, so far, and I haven't done much with it on this blade, but I have, uh, with the, um, Formax scout, I've done a lot with that Formax scout and it just, Man, it just keeps on coming. Uh, so I think that's a good steel with a great heat treat. That's kind of a cold steel's thing. So here's the clip point. Uh, by the way, I was looking at this today, just holding it up against the sky. That was a gray sky and uh, just s silhouetting it. And it, this is a perfect clip point blade, just the perfect shape in my to my eye. And it's not something that I can quite analyze. It just is. And I'm going to put it like that so you can see it. 
All right, next up, uh, this is also a re recent reacquisition because I got rid of my old XL um, Tonto in OS 8, and I decided this time I'd get sassy and get serrations, really nice serrations. Love the serrations on these knives. Um, it's a big, big, sharp scoop with five tiny teeth and a big, sharp scoop and five tiny teeth. It is devastating. And um, it's kind of a devastating to take care of, too, when you dull them. Uh, those little teeth are kind of a pain in the butt. But you can get sharpeners that fit perfectly in there. Or you can sort of, you know, fake it with a with a um, sharp maker, triangle sharp maker. Uh, but I figured on this one that has a pretty straight edge, unlike the medium uh, version or the large version of this, the four inch version, which has kind of a sweep to it. This one has more of a sharp uh, straight edge. I figured I'd get it serrated just to double double the power. Um, awesome. Uh, I mean, also in OS 10A, I love that handle. Now, the, the benefit of this handle is that you can come all the way up here if you need to get close to the edge for precision, or you can come back here. This is kind of the main, uh, main posture or position, I should say, to hold it in. Or you can come back here. This is nice. I like this back here because when you're a little bit on this horn in these two finger grooves, you can you can use it like a drumstick to do light chopping. And then I guess in a pinch, you can come all the way back here to reach something. Or or I know I've seen Lynn Thompson say that you can nestle it in your palm and use it like a push dagger. I don't know. That, that's not me. Uh, I would just rather use a push dagger. Uh, but there it is, the Tonto. Next up, my favorite of all shapes, <clears throat> or I should say blade shapes, uh, uh, by them. Uh, I'm I'm going to, no, well, okay, we'll, we'll go to this first, actually. Uh, the drop point. Now, the drop point is also an OS 10A. And this joined the family, joined the, uh, I should say, joined the lineup, uh, I believe right after the a few years after the vaquero but before the chris which we'll see in a second this not just your average drop point you know drop points i'm i always kind of talk about how they bore me a little bit but this has a continuous belly to it making it look a bit like a barong uh, you know my one of my favorite uh filipino sword short swords with the leaf shaped blade so yeah it is a drop point but it's not like an essie uh drop point that has a, a straight blade that goes up sweeps up to the drop it is a continuous belly giving you some behind the belly right here behind the belly kind of like recurve sort of right here uh, or at least a downward uh, downward angle and then you have all of that sweep uh, this is not full flat ground as you can see this is a very high saber grind or flat grind uh, i guess it's a very high flat grind a saber grind only comes to the to the middle or lower, I guess. Uh, next up, this is exciting. The Chris. This thing is incredible. I mean, and what's incredible about it is not just the shape. It is not just for like ooh and ah factor. Uh, that is a really, really wicked blade shape for slashing and for thrusting. It's horrifying. Uh, each one of those waves widens the opening of whatever you're opening by, you know, a, a pretty big factor. It's like a giant bread knife with a point, a hawk bill point, no less. So on a slash, it's, it's nasty. If on a cut, it's hard. It, 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 this is really pretty, pretty brutal knife, pretty nasty design, uh, designed by this looks more to me like a Filipino, Chris, uh, the, uh, um, the tie light, the large tie light looks more like a, an Indonesian Chris to me. That's just my thoughts. Uh, awesome. I put the aluminum, the raw aluminum. Um, what do you call it? Uh, Snaggletooth X X uh, Snaggletooth MF on there. So I can wave open this blade. It's a pocket deployer aftermarket by uh, Snaggletooth. And then lastly, and this is, this is my favorite of all uh, cold steel shapes. And I have a couple of them, and I want I want some of the older ones, too. But it's the uh, Vaquero. There it is. The Vaquero is, uh, despite the name Vaquero, which is like a, what, a Mexican cowboy, um, this blade design in particular was inspired um, by 
the Yatagan. Uh, and, th- and that's coming out of his mouth, the Yatagan, uh, him being uh, Lynn Thompson. The Yatagan is a Turkish blade with that deep recurve, but with the point right on center line, uh, which <clears throat> is handy in thrusting from all angles because uh, you don't have to torque your wrist in any certain direction to account for the curve. Uh, that point is right in the center line. Yatagan is a very cool knife uh, slash short sword. Uh, definitely check it out. Uh, Turkish in origin, but I do believe, well, there was a, when they first came out with the, with the Vaquero and the El Hombre, which was the four, four inch version way back in the late nineties of this shape, it was different. It looked different. It was, it, it still had the S curve, but the overall shape of it was slightly different. And I'm wondering if it wasn't uh, first inspired by Mexican knives and Navajas and then, and then with the reshape and the redesign of the Vaquero um, become more like a Yadagon. Are there any cold steel nerds out there who hear me? <laughs> I mean, or am I just going down a wormhole because, uh, or a rabbit hole that, that is a, a, I'm pretty sure that's a thing. I mean, I've been observant the whole time and uh, I'm pretty sure when that design change happened, uh, when they re when they redesigned the handles and all that, um, I'm pretty sure the inspiration for the blade shifted from South America, or, yeah, from from the Mexico area and Spain area, Spain, Mexico as influenced by Spain over to Turkey. I don't know. Let me know. Maybe I should talk to Lynn Thompson. If that would ever happen, that'd be awesome. Uh, we had flirted at one time and broke off our dance. All right, next up is the last one, and it's the Lynn Thompson Signature Edition serrated vaquero in cts xhp this one is number 126 out of how many i don't know but it's pretty at this point uh it's pretty valued knife you can find them for a lot on ebay every once in a while i I have a snaggle tooth uh, on there too for pocket deployment this is just an absolutely wicked and vicious blade with that shape and those serrations added on. And then, of course, I mention this all the time. I love the cognitive dissonance of that wicked, nasty, gnarly blade with Lynn Thompson's um, second-grade school teacher signature on there in perfect cursive. Lynn C. Thompson. (laughs) I, I, I like that a lot. It's, you know, if they made it in pink, Oh, man, people would be confused. Be like, Is that a deadly weapon or just something so cute and charming? And I'd say, yes. All right, that is it. I, I put a question mark on this. Uh, I, actually, I put an exclamation mark, but when I, when, I, when I announced it, I put a question mark because there is one uh, that I want uh, that is out there, uh, but it is very hard to get. And that is a limited edition uh, signature um, Tonto that is serrated or half serrated. And it's a Lynn. It's not a Lynn Thompson. It's a um, can't remember the name of the guy. Something Rawls. He used to have, or still does have, a survival blog, and they did a special one of these with the green handle, the black blade. I believe it was 440C. It was a, it was an off steel for cold steel, uh, but um, I want that in the collection. And then it's done. And then it is 100% done, except maybe a regular uh, silver bladed. Vaquero with serrations. Okay. All right. Yes. I'm going to change the subject now because I can hear you all saying change the subject. And now I'm going to my top drawer fixed blade knives. Now, this is coming from, uh, and I think it's a beginning of the year examination of my collection goals. And um, right now, I, I don't really have any fixed blade knives that I want to part with. And I, and I, but I do have some emotional support folders that I could get rid of. Now, these emotional support folders I've kept because they're cool. Let me just say that. They're cool, but they're not valuable, uh, and they're not valuable to me in any sort of sentimental way. Uh, So I think those knives I can get rid of. And as I do, I want to start refining. I know I've said that for a long time, but these are the kind of things I'm looking to move more towards. Now, I have a, a bunch of custom i have a number of custom medium and small fixed blade knives and i would love to continue doing that and i will show those off again sometime soon but this is kind of where my mind is right now large fixed blades what can i say so to start this off is the toppest drawer of the top drawer and that's the 
hogtooth uh hogtooth knives subhilt folder a loveless subhilt folder bob loveless came up with this design putting the subhilt on a double-edged very slender double-edged clip point blade and i've always wanted a custom version of this and so this was my 50th birthday um custom knife uh funded by my parents and designed by me um very uh very this is my proudest knife i love this thing uh but it's got a damascus blade or pattern weld blade that's 15 and 20 and 1095 steel that had just been cut and recut and stacked and placed in so many cool different configurations uh, to come up with that cross pattern and then you have wrought iron uh, that was uh, taken from the longfellow bridge uh, when it was being rehabbed in boston yeah black micarta there and then a gorgeous stag handle that stag handle was a very difficult feat it was hard for him to find stag that was even that would fit and um and then the construction under here is pretty outrageous this is a like a u-shape metal under here and then the tang comes in here and it's a pretty complex build and i i have uh i know from matt he has gotten some requests for a knife like this after people have seen this and once they hear the quote because uh it was more of a pain in the butt than he thought it would be to build um basically they've they've gone elsewhere or just <laughs> dropped the idea because it, it turned out to be a lot of work in it and uh next time he would charge more than what he charged for this i believe uh so this is definitely um uh, my top shelf uh large fixed blade knife this is my dual knife you know the 10 dual commandments this is what i bring i mean you know besides the gun all right oh and by the way look at this absolutely beautiful leather sheath uh it looks like a corset to me um is so just really really nice leather work i mean his leather work is as great as his work with knives i gotta say uh next up the randall made knife this was one of two randall made knives i got and i kind of gotta say never again unless i shouldn't say never but unless i i come by a sweet deal they just are so expensive and i feel like uh, they've gotten like a lot more expensive even than since i've gotten these and this was like two and a half years ago i i bought these but this is the uh special the the 16 special number one fighter i can never remember exactly how it's it, it goes because i've seen it a number of different ways but what it is it's the number 16 which is a dive knife and you can see it's got sort of a dive handle with all of those uh, finger grooves but they put the number one fighter blade on it, the seven inch standard uh, number one model on there, or number num number one model blade on there. Beautiful clip point blade with a sharpened swedge up to here, like pretty much every other Randall made knife has that back edge sharp to the crest right there. Even their little hunting knives, even, even when it seems like it might be impractical to have it sharp, they have it sharp. And you know that I love that. Uh, beautiful brass uh, cross guard here. Uh, the bottom quillion is longer than the top. I love the way that works. I love the way that feels and looks. Um, and then you've got the finger grooves. Green uh, linen micarta on my handle. Interesting thing about the, the way they build these let me i'm gonna raise my camera up just a little because of all these very large knives uh oh you're gonna see how the sausage is made okay interesting thing about the handle the handles on these is it's a channel you get a channel there and the tang is dropped in the top of the channel and the mechanical connection is right there with that lanyard tube and then the rest it's uh friction fit and epoxy uh, epoxied in there uh 440c i believe done just like they've done it since world war ii basically uh maybe maybe some of the processes have changed a little but you can see all the the machine marks and i mean if you look closely you know you can see some of uh, the grinder marks and stuff like that the the buffer it's just beautiful i've had people comment i had one guy comment in particular say um oh that's like a totally unrefined knife like 
not worth the money. And, and, and maybe, maybe, but it depends on why you're buying your knives and what you're, you know, when I got this knife, there were a couple of things I was thinking. One of them, and kind of the chief thing is that I love this knife. I've always wanted the the number one blade from the Randall made knives and also the 14 Bowie. Uh, but I've always wanted this blade shape and it is a storied company. I want them to remain alive. And um, there's a lot of history in these beautiful knives. So to me, that is worth some things like I remember the person in particular uh, mentioned being able to see like it's not a, a totally lustrous finish and all that. And and yeah, I get it. Like if if you're if that's what you're looking for, something kind of art knifey or super high high polish. Um, I get that. But I'm looking for a combat classic from a classic American knife company. And uh, man, that fits the bill. What a beauty. This knife, uh, this blade, I should say, uh, did did a lot of time in World War II. This was a big knife in World War II. Now, uh, not with this handle, but a slightly different handle and number of different handles. But uh, so this is the number 16 uh, special fighter with the number one blade. By the way, their um, leather sheaths are also very, very nice. As you can see there. All right. Next up is also a Randall made knife. Uh, this is the Randall number two dash seven. Now, when you see a Randall, uh, when you see that it written out, the the first is the number is the model number. This is the model number two combat stiletto. And then the dash and then the number after that is how how long the blade is. So this is a seven inch dagger. Another beautiful uh leather sheath with that gorgeous stitching and there is the blade this is the commando style handle i love this style handle uh with the stacked leather and the aluminum cap you can when you order this knife okay so both of these i got from uh knife center they had them in stock and they happen to be like what i want so i got them uh whereas if you want to order this exact thing um, and you can't find it already somewhere, which there are only a few dealers that have them on hand, um, then you're going to order it and wait five years. So I lucked out because this is, if I were to get the combat stiletto uh, from scratch, this is the exact configuration. So I lucked out big time. To me, it's the most classic. I love the brass uh, cross quillions, even cross quillions there. And then the stacked leather handle with that with that nice uh, wasted not wasted that sounds wasted dude this uh you know a uh, bulbous coke bottle sort of handle uh looking a lot like a commando knife um it is not round in cross section it is oval so you can you can hold it sideways like this you can know the orientation of the edges by hold you know in the dark by holding it of course you could tell by the quillions but if you're not up there you know you can tell by the shape of the handle and it's not going to turn or rotate in the hand you have uh, a bit of a ricasso here so you can come up and uh, put your finger there i know that there's a fighting style called the randall method um where they would hold it like this and use the use the uh, back edge much like you know we talk here about how that back edge is used in bowie knife fighting and sometimes they even turn the knife around like in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And there was another cowboy movie where they did that. Uh, so, yeah, this is just, to me, a classic beautiful stiletto. To me, it's the American uh, sort of answer to the Swiss Army, uh, Swiss Army knife, the um, the British commando knife, the, the Fairbairn Sykes. And this came out during World War II as well. So it's kind of the American version of it. I love it. I love the, the belly and the substantial... Uh, sort of uh, parallel lines of the edges to about two thirds of the way down. Um, and that maintains some of that slashing and cutting capability. A constant taper on a dagger is great for thrusting, no doubt, uh, but maybe not as good for slashing and cutting. Um, so another great top shelf knife. Uh, love this. This is an heirloom piece. And now, you know, with the way and things are built now and with the materials, you know, my Gerber Zilch is an heirloom piece. At least it will last 
way longer than me. Uh, but this is the kind of thing I'd be proud to hand down. Um, I better start working on. No, I'm not even going to say that. All right. Next up <laughs> is the Spartan Harzy dagger. Since we're on the topic of daggers. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Oh God. Uh, so Spartan, Har uh, Spartan has, uh, of course the less George dagger and now they have the V44 and now they have a new one that's coming out. I think they're calling it the Raider dagger. It is so gorgeous and it's priced within reason. And what I mean by that is this is a very expensive dagger. This Spartan Harzy, uh, designed by Bill Harzy, um, and one of two daggers when, uh, at the time by him and then one by, uh, Les George in the Spartan, um, catalog, but they're $400 knives. You know, they're expensive. I got this for a deal and I got it with the leather sheath, which is how I would get it. That's Chattanooga leather, by the way. Um, so, uh, but they have one that's coming up for like less than 200 bucks designed by Les George. That is absolutely gorgeous. If you love daggers, please check that out, but don't buy it before I get mine. I think they're going to be sold out everywhere uh, initially anyway. Um, so let me pull this out of the sheath. By the way, I love the um, the logo of the Hoplite helmet with the crossed arrows emblazoned in that leather. Chattanooga Leather Works, uh, owned by RMJ uh, and American Tomahawk Company. Those three uh, companies are all one. Look at that thing. Um, six inch hollow ground double bevel. Uh, that hollow grind really makes it a little bit thinner behind the edge than most daggers, which makes it uh, better for slashing and cutting. Uh, you don't want to be a one trick pony. Um, you know, this is, you don't want this to be just an assassin's knife. You must thrust it in. And that is the only way you want it to be capable of other things. But this also uh, inspired by that sort of wasp waisted handle, that sort of uh, Fairbairn Sykes style handle. Um, I had, uh, I had Curtis Iovito on the, the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, that would be an interesting show for you to check out. Um, I want to have him back on and talk about some of the stuff they've been doing recently, but he's a great guy. Uh, check him out. It's episode 152. That was the knife junkie.com slash one five two to listen to Curtis Iavito. Uh, one of two of the men who started Spartan blades. They they're cool, man. They're really cool guys. They're both ex, you know, badasses, current badasses, but I mean, ex military guys, snipers, I believe. And, um, just have an amazing knife company. Oh, yes. Okay, so I'm going to take this one and put it aside. Um, this is the smallest. Oh, no, it's not. I take it back. It is the smallest of the daggers, however. All right, next up is uh, a slight gear shift from uh, fighting knife to nearly art knife. This is the Murray Carter neck knife. Murray Carter was on the show um episode 344 here that's the knife junkie.com slash 344 <laughs> uh but he really this guy you got to check this guy out he is he was a canadian and at age 19 went to japan to start learning knife making and he uh fell under the tutelage of a village knife maker or i should say a village blacksmith and the village blacksmiths uh, and metal workers took care of everything, including making knives, making tools. That's what they did mostly was make tools. But while he was there learning, he learned some ancient forms of Japanese steel making and working. And um, so Murray Carter has built his career on that. And by the way, he wasn't just an apprentice. He became the local uh, blade guy and knife guy uh, for that town for years and he he was like <laughs> what was he he was the first american first white guy uh in a tradition that was 740 years long to have that position and he makes outstandingly beautiful knives this was his that he wore for years and he gave it to me after the podcast and um after the time he came on he's wanted to thank me for what i do for the community and uh, he gave it to me so I really, really appreciate that. He has a very unique setup in his shop. He's got a number of people that he has trained, and it's kind of a revolving thing in his way of knife making. And then they make knives of their own design and then also follow, following similar patterns. 
under his shop and put his logo on and then their own logo and and sell it from uh from his shop i think that's a really cool and old school way of doing it and i love it let's just look at that folded steel mm. gorgeous feels great in the hand and is quite light interesting he calls it the neck knife and he has it <clears throat> excuse me he has the kydex set up exclusively for a neck knife carry with those two holes beautifully done okay next next up back to the fighters uh, this one is my first custom knife purchase ever and uh it's from attention to detail mercantile and douglas esposito it's wearing a sheath made by my brother um my design a flawed design i wanted this to carry like a big bowie that has a nub and just slides in the belt but i didn't realize the blade is way too short to do that so uh, but a beautiful nonetheless from my brother. Let me pull this out now. <clears throat> this is uh, Douglas Esposito's um, medium fighter. This is the medium fighter. A2D stands for attention to detail mercantile. That's S35VN uh, blade steel with two hollow grinds. And I had him sharpen the top. And I picked it up from his shop when he was uh, near me in Manassas. Uh, Virginia. He is now in Missouri. I think he's in Missouri now. Um, but he is a uh, former Marine and a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and coach. And he had a beautiful uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu studio, or I should say it was like a warehouse. And then his knife shop was in the back. It was very cool. And I went to pick this up. Beautiful crowned spine on this knife. And just look, this thing is luxurious. I used to call it a classy assassin's knife, uh, but maybe I, I will dis distance myself from that. Um, nice tortoise shell and brass. I, I saw something else he made with tortoise shell, and I, 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 I love it. I just love tortoise shell. So this was my first custom. And uh, yeah, I love this thing. Very, very sharp. And I, at first I was upset by how it, the blade got marred from the Kydex sheath that he made for it. But now I just, I just like the history in it. I don't carry it much. It's just on the other side of too large for me. Next up is a camp knife. And this one, when I got it a couple of years back, you might remember, uh, really captured my heart in a, in a, in a, in a, um, very sentimental kind of way. I kind of like the ways I talk about my, some of my favorite great Eastern cutlery knives. It evoked a time in this country that I didn't experience I looked at this knife and and immediately thought, uh, or it immediately took me to a time in this country when, at least when we look back on it, things seemed less complicated. Who knows, when you're living in the time, at whatever given time, it's as complicated as it's ever been, so you have no future reference. But now we look back at the turn of the century, we look back at the you know, the first half of the 20th century is what I'm getting at. We look at the turn of the, the previous, you know, the 18th, uh, the 19th into the 20th century and the first part of the 20th century. And there's a, there was a, I don't know, at least from my perspective in time and growing up in the 70s and 80s and, and some of that stuff was still fresh. You know, in the 70s, you're watching shows that were made in the 40s and 50s, you know, with Little Rascals and, uh, you know, and then the 50s and 60s. You're, you're getting a lot of older influence, the, the more, quote unquote, wholesome America. And that's what this reminds me of. This reminds me of the kind of knife a dad would carry when they go camping, you know, back in the 40s or whatever. Here, here's the thing. Go do this. Go to your favorite search engine and type in under images, do an image search of early 20th century camping artwork and you'll know exactly what i mean the kind of stuff that was in the outdoor magazines the kind of stuff that was in uh, boy scout uh, illustrations and stuff that's what this reminds me of uh, early uh, ammunition packaging <laughs> are you picking up what i'm putting down people anyway uh, besides all of what it, it evoked uh, emotionally this was my backyard knife for a, a few years it replaced the uh, for a while I was using the tops Tex Creek 
whenever I'd go out back and things needed clearing or anything needed cutting or carving or whatever, this was the knife I was bringing. 3V steel, this was my first blade with 3V steel, a gorgeous clip point with a fuller. And the other thing I like about this knife is that it these were the proto versions uh, which led up to the K-Bar knife. These were the kind of hunting knives that GIs were bringing on their own uh, to battle um, in World War II, especially towards the beginning. And then these were the kind of kind of hunting knives uh, that were kind of the um, the jumping off point in designing the um, the K bar clip point classic American style knife stacked leather handle. These are uh, these Bark River knives antiqued stacked leather handles are very nice. So that's what that is, and a great sheath as can be expected from Bark River knives. Also can be expected from Bark River knives is a convex grind. Very, very, very excellent for um, for working wood and remains very sharp and is does well under impact because of the shape. Okay, uh, next, also a Bark River. There are a couple of Bark Rivers in this list. This is one that they have out right now, I believe. Uh, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. The last one I show you they have out right now. This is the V44 Bowie uh, based on here. I'm just going to show it in this beautiful um, sheath with the frog. You can take it out of the frog and slip it under your belt with that or leave it hanging from your belt. But this is based on the Marine Raider knife, the Marine Raider Bowie, um, that big, broad clip point blade, um, much like the Western W49 and other knives we can think of. It's got a very distinct bowie shape in that it's got a wide, you know, it's wide down by the Ricasso. It widens out to a nice thick belly, and then it has a curved clip. This is uh, not, this is, what is this? Uh, three eighths, uh, this is three sixteenths of an inch thick, unlike the standard quarter inch bowie. Uh, and I think that that is because this was used a lot in the South Pacific. Uh, as a, you know, machete, as a clearing thing, as well as a weapon. Uh, but this was kind of, you know, so you don't want it too thick. You don't want it too heavy. They had those Collins machetes like I have on the wall. Uh, that thing is a beast. So, you know, this one right here. So if you can minimize uh, weight with your other knives, uh, have at it. And so they made that a thinner blade. This one has the, um, and and that can also be seen in the Western uh, Western uh, W49 Bowie that can be seen in the Wild West Bowie, which is kind of like this by Cold Steel. Uh, they put the S guard in here. I do like the uneven quillions a lot. And then I got the Morant. Actually, they're not uneven. It They only look uneven because I got the Morant style handle. Uh, so instead of having the straight out handle, which looks a little funky on this knife, I got to say, um, because it, kind of like the K bar. It's a little bit offset from the center. The center line of the handle is offset from the center line of the blade. And it looks weird to me, but on this cur curvy horse hoof Moran style handle, all contoured and nice like that. Uh, it looks great because the spine aligns with the top of the handle. And then, and then this doesn't have to, and it makes the blade look more dramatic. Um, and it also uh, sets the blade below your knuckles. So very, very nice. Beautiful, beautiful knife. This was a gift from my dad for Christmas a few years ago. Um, yep, I've turned him in a full-fledged knife junkie with this show. So thanks, Dad. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What? It's never too late to become a knife junkie. My dad is proof. All right. Next up, and penultimate knife. This is... The one I've been, man, I've been wanting this for so long. Finally got my hands on it. This is the Natchez Bowie by Cold Steel. Now, I'm saying Natchez now because someone, <coughs> excuse me, helpfully uh, uh, told me how to say it. I've been saying Natchez and and that is sounding like a total yank, trying to not sound like a yank, I guess. But it's Natchez. Uh, so Natchez. It's the Natchez Bowie. Just a beautiful Musso style Bowie, uh, kind of uh, at least in terms of the um, mythology, the style of Bowie that uh, Jim Bowie had. I will not say Bowie 
or sometimes I do, but I don't say it as a matter of course. So you can't correct me on that. But uh, yeah, so James Bowie, uh, they think Jim Bowie used a knife that looked like this on the um, sandbar fight, but who knows? We don't know. We've seen a lot of examples that people think it looks like oftentimes it doesn't really look too much like a Bowie, as a matter of fact. Uh, sometimes it looks more like uh, just a sharpened pry bar kind of thing. Uh, but this graceful, gracefully curved blade long, it's got a 12 inch, 12 and a, let's say 12 and a quarter inch blade uh, right around in there. Nice, long, sharp. That's about a five inch sharp swedge. Now that's a zero ground sharp, meaning... Um, it's kind of like a giant Scandi blade there. Um, you're not going to slice bread with it, but you could definitely do some damage with impact uh, or just drag cutting with that swedge. Uh, this one has really nicely done handles, uh, G10 handle scales. Or is this my card? They're not scales. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm just talking at this point. Uh, but very nice handles contoured. You got a cable tang in here. That means the tang comes fully down to here. You can see someone uh, take this apart on YouTube. I can't remember who does it though. Uh, cable, uh, the tang comes down to about here. And then from here, uh, mechanically and soldered, uh, there is a cable that comes to here where there's a nut that screws this cap on. And that actually uh, has proven to be pretty strong. I mean, I haven't seen anyone have tang issues with their notches or... Um, or Laredo Bowie's. They both have that cable tang style thing. And it's believed, anyway, I believe it, I should say, that that absorbs shock on a big knife like this when you're, say you're using this for something other than fighting. Even though it's a fighting Bowie, say you're using it for something other than fighting. Uh, the shock will not be, you're cutting trees down or you're, you're, making, uh, you're making kindling. That shock isn't going to get to your hands as much, apparently. All right, last in this list, a glorious Bowie, one of my all-time favorites in execution and design is the Shining Mountain Bowie. This one uh, is the same as these other two Bark River knives, but this one I got treated uh, for water, you know, uh, water treated, I guess. Uh, what do you call it? Waterproofing, and it makes the sheath dark and beautiful. All right, here it is, that famous Shining Mountain Bowie. Uh, blade shape. Now, this one is indeed um, going to be, uh, this one indeed is an, is available right now. It's one that they have uh, come out with recently, though. What happens with these is, uh, with Bark River knives in general, they release a pattern in a million different handles, uh, and a lot of them are very expensive, uh, but, but the micarta handles are, are less expensive. Some of the uh, well, the leather stacked and some of the some of the more pedestrian woods, but they get very expensive uh, with the handle scales or with the different handle materials. And usually those very, very expensive ones are the ones that are left after the first feeding frenzy or when a popular model is released. And this one is definitely a popular model. Uh, this design by Mike Stewart, that blade shape has been used uh, by his former company, Blackjack Knives, former and current. Uh, blackjack knives. Also, I believe Winchester has used this. And of course, that's the blade shape that we see Brad Pitt carrying in Inglorious Bastards. I always bring that up. Um, I, but that's not a Bark River and it's not a, um, it's not a blackjack. I think it's a Winchester and they uh, retrofit it with a really cool stag crown handle. So, this is where I hope to uh, lead my knife collection during the year, during this year, 2023. I, I, of course, will be keeping up with some of the some of the more trendy stuff um, as it comes out and excites me because it does. But this stuff will always, always uh, dominate my heart. Bowie knives, short swords, swords, even that comment before those Bowie knives look ridiculous. But I'll take a big, ridiculous Arkansas toothpick. I love that. So that's uh, that's what this channel is about, and that's where I'm going to keep going. All right. Thank you so much for checking out this edition of the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, we will be here again next Wednesday with another midweek supplemental. Of course, check us out every Thursday night for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube. You can also check it out on Facebook or Twitch. And then, of course, check us out Sunday for the uh, the great interview shows we do. 
All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast